good to see you all in God's house tonight. We give you a very warm welcome, and especially if you're visiting with us. We thank you so much for coming, and you're very, very welcome indeed. Those tuning on through social media, pray that you'll enjoy the meeting tonight as well. We're going to open our service properly by singing 203. What a lovely testimony hymn it is, well known, I'm sure, to most of us. I was sinking deep in sin, sinking to rise no more. Overwhelmed by guilt within, mercy I did implore. Then the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. Christ my Saviour lifted me, now safe am I. Let's all stand and let's really sing it out with all of our hearts.
Amen. That's good singing. Let's bow in prayer and seek the Lord's face as we come into his presence tonight. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank thee for this lovely hymn that we've been singing. We praise thee for the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We praise thee that God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And O God, as we approach thy throne of grace, again tonight, pleading the merits of the precious blood, we thank thee for loving us with an everlasting love. We praise thee for Calvary. And we thank thee that Calvary is the proof that God loves sinners. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And, O oh God, we pray for this meeting this evening. We thank thee for each one gathered in tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you would come and meet us all at the very point of our need. We thank thee for those that are saved, those that are heaven-bound. And we pray, Lord, that you'll encourage us and strengthen our faith tonight. And we pray for those in the meeting who are not saved, those listening on who are still strangers to grace and to God, that even this night they would come and put their faith and trust in the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. We pray that you'll save souls tonight for thy glory. We thank thee, Lord, that you're still in the soul-saving business. And we pray, Lord, that you'll come and speak to hearts, close us in with yourself, move by your gracious Holy Spirit. We pray for conviction of sin. We pray for true repentance and faith. And we pray, Lord, for the glory of God in the salvation of men and women young people and boys and girls this evening. Bless the Reverend Martin. We thank thee for him. And we pray, Lord, as he testifies this evening that he would know the help of the Lord. Bless our brother David as he sings. We thank thee, Lord, for the song of the soul set free. O God, come and meet with us now in Jesus' precious, precious name we ask it. Amen. Amen. It is good to see you all here tonight. And we do welcome you all in the Savior's precious name. We're delighted to have our good friend and brother, Mr. David Warwick, with us. David's no stranger to us here in Tondra Gee, and we always enjoy him when he comes along. We welcome you and your wife and family tonight. I'm going to ask David to come and bring us a couple of messages and so on. Here tonight. Um, yesterday evening, we, uh, Stephen Greer, had organised uh, a concert in Ballymena Town Hall, the Braid. And I have 25 CDs with me here tonight, and Lavelle asked me to give it a little plug. So uh, it's a compilation CD. Um, the Greer family is on it. Uh, Carla Hunter, uh, John Porter, uh, myself, Ethan McKillen. Um, the Brook Quartet. Um, yeah, there's some more. Uh, but we had a great night last night. Um, the town hall was full. We actually had it on another show at four o'clock. And all proceeds of this CD is going for uh, Precious Orphanage in Nepal and also uh, to Building Bridges who work with the addicted in Ballymena. So I just, there you are. That's the plug for, for that. So it's a CD, I know maybe we all don't have CDs, but Christmas is coming. I'm sure you could buy it for, for Sunday uh, on Christmas Day, uh, who has a CD player. But there'll be other products available next week, like we'll oh, be able to download that there. So the first piece we're going to sing um, is called The Voice of My Beloved. Say 
voice, hear the voice of my beloved, saying the best is yet to come. I can hear the voice of my beloved when the storm is raging all around. Trust in me, I'll strengthen you and keep you in his presence. Perfect peace is found through the valleys and over the mountains. He will guide me the way that is best. He has planned each joy and each sorrow. I'll trust in him and I'll be blessed. He has blessed me, richly blessed me, and I'll worship him alone. Hear the voice, hear the voice of my beloved, saying the best is yet to come. When I see with all heaven's beauty, and I made the way he'd have me be, when I hear the angels sing in glory, and I feel the hands of Jesus holding me. I will love him perfectly forever, with no sin or potential to roam. And I'll praise and worship my beloved when he says, at last you're home. He has blessed me, richly blessed me, and I'll worship him alone. Hear the voice, hear the voice of my beloved, saying the best is yet to come. He has blessed me, richly blessed me, and I'll worship him alone. Hear the voice, hear the voice of my beloved, saying the best is yet to come. stop to wonder what this life is all about why you're here and where you're going when your leaves on time runs out maybe you've been far too busy trying hard to reach your goal ask you kindly have you thought about your soul you may reach the highest portals and your dreams may all come true wealth and fame may be your portion and success may shine on you all your friends may sing your praises, not a care on you may roll. What about the 
the great tomorrow have you thought about your soul if you've never thought it over spend a little time today there is nothing more important that will ever come your way than the joy of sins forgiven and to know you've been made whole in the name of Christ the Savior have you thought about your soul in the name of Christ the Savior have you thought about your soul? Amen. The Lord bless those lovely hymns to all of our hearts. I didn't know Ashley was going to be singing with David tonight, but certainly we enjoyed that. And we do pray as they continue to serve the Lord in this way that the Lord will continue to use them. Now let me again take this opportunity of welcoming each and every one along to our special family night service tonight. You are indeed all very welcome, and especially if you're visiting, and I see a number of visitors in tonight, you're very, very welcome indeed. And we just want to remind you that there's supper for everyone this evening, and uh, please wait behind for something to eat after the meeting. We'll be going through the link door if you haven't been here before through the link and into the church hall. And please, we would encourage you all to stay for some supper this evening and a time of fellowship uh, together. Just a few announcements, and I'm going to run through these very, very quickly. I'm not going to go over all the announcements that I went through this morning, but do remember, on Tuesday night, of course, at 8 o'clock, we're having our special baptismal service uh, where a number of God's people are going to go through the waters of baptism. Uh, we would encourage as many to come along to the meeting on, on Tuesday night. Everyone's welcome to come along, and there's a light supper for everyone after the baptismal service. And we're really looking forward to the meeting on Tuesday night. Now, the service itself will not be online, so if you want to uh, take part in that service, then you'll have to come again in person, and we would invite you to do that on Tuesday evening. Wednesday morning, the little treasures at 10 a.m., and then on Friday night, the children's meeting, the children's meeting plus and the YM at 7 p.m., and then the youth fellowship at 8 p.m. And please continue to pray for the youth work here on Friday night, really encouraging to see so many children, young people, here in the church on Friday evening. You pray for them and pray for the workers as well, that the Lord will give them help and grace as they handle and deal with so many boys and girls. But we're, the, we're really thrilled to see so many children. And let me say again, if you want to help out in the children's work in any way on a Friday night, there's plenty of work to do. And your help would be very much appreciated. Now, we're so thankful for the, the many workers that we have, but there's always room for more. My friend, don't come into this church and say you have nothing to do. There's nothing to do here. There's plenty of work for you, especially on a Friday evening. I wonder, would you give your time on a Friday night to get the gospel out to the boys and girls? 90% of these children that come on a Friday evening, uh, they're unchurched children. They, that's the only time they're in church, the only time they hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and how we need to seek to win them for the Lord. So do please, please remember that. And if you can help, you see Margaret or Philip or see our brother Phil Harton, and he'll certainly give you a, a job to do. Next Lord's Day, the Sunday school at a quarter past 10, the Bible classes at 10.30, the services at 11.30 and 6.30 p.m., preceded by the half hour of prayer. Next Sunday morning, the Reverend Baxter will be here to preach. I'll be going to Castle Derg to preach at a harvest service, so please remember us as we travel. I'll be back next Sunday night to preach in the gospel. The singers next Sunday evening will be our sister Grace McClintock and our two daughters, Ellie and Katie. And we always enjoy 
McClintock's when they come to sing. And I would invite you all back again next Sunday evening. And I believe that you'll enjoy uh, uh, the meeting. Now, next Lord's Day, as I announced this morning, being the first Sunday of the month, is the church maintenance offering. And if you can help in this, then that will be very much appreciated. And please give as the Lord has laid upon your heart. Next Sunday afternoon also, uh, there's a gospel mission commencing in Cloncourt Orange Hall at 3.30 p.m. And it's going on all of next week, uh, the following week, Monday to Friday. There are leaflets at the door. Please take one and pray for that mission. If you're able to come, we'd be delighted to see you. It's organized by our church in Portadown. And the Reverend Abernethy and myself will be the preachers night after night. But please take that mission upon your heart and pray, pray uh, for it. The Vision magazines are available if you haven't got your copy as yet as you leave the church. The Let the Bible Speak quarterly magazines are also available. And you can take a copy of those as you leave uh, the church. Do remember, Saturday the 30th of September, this Saturday in the Martyrs, 7 p.m., the Presbytery have organized an information rally concerning these new proposed laws of, on the RSE that the government are seeking to introduce into the schools. And the speaker is Mr. Colin Webster from the Christian Institute, and we would encourage as many to go along to that meeting as possible. The Ladies' Fellowship recommencing Thursday the 5th of October at 8 p.m. here in the church. And the special speaker that night will be our sister and Mrs. Vi uh, Dawson. Now, I think that's all the announcements. We're going to sing another hymn. The offering is going to be taken up. It's hymn number 241. Sing them o'er again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. We'll keep our seats for the first couple of verses as the offering is being taken up.
Our brother Edward Smith is having a gospel mission in Laurel Vale Mission Hall. Started this afternoon. Uh, it's on every night this week. He asked me would I give it an announcement for him and only too glad to do that. So please, if you can get along, you'll be very welcome. Please pray for that mission. Do remember the CD that our brother David uh, advertised tonight. Uh, there's copies here and if you see him, he'll be able to get you one of those. We are delighted tonight to have the Reverend Thomas Martin with us this evening and we welcome him in the Saviour's precious, precious name. The first time I met Thomas Martin uh, it was in Long Cash Prison. The only thing was the day I went in I could get back out again. He had to stay. But it's nearly 40 years ago when we first went in to preach in Long Cash when Tom was an inmate there and we were delighted to meet him at that time, him and his brother Dave. And certainly what a shining light they were in the prison after they were saved by God's grace. Tom, you're very welcome. Thanks. And may they bless you, brother, as you testify tonight. Thank you. Appreciate that, John. That was over 40 years ago, by the way. I didn't mention that. That was over 40 years ago whenever I met him. I haven't heard it called Long Cash in a long, long time. In fact, I wasn't in Long Cash. I was in the maze, which is the, the cellular block. Long Cash was for political prisoners, those whose crimes were committed before 1976. Sorry to give the history lesson here, but I say it for a reason because I got a tattoo when I was in the maze with LK on it, Long Cash. And whenever I got saved and I came out of prison, my brother Colin, who wasn't saved, he said to my father, he says, these brothers of mine are fanatic fanatics. And my dad says, what do you mean? He says, they've even got Bible verses tattooed on their arms. Thomas has Luke's gospel, <laughs> but it was LK. It wasn't Luke's gospel. It was long cash. It's still there. It's nearly faded. And it's a few other uh, writings as well. And uh, it was done inside the prison with Indian ink. I remember one guy, it wasn't in the prison, but he was outside and he decided to do a homemade tattoo. And so he got in front of the mirror and he tattooed UDA on his arm. And whenever he saw it, showed it to his mates, they said, what's the ado? <laughs> he had done it the wrong way around. <laughs> he had done it in the mirror, but that's the prods for you. That's all I can say. He had done it the wrong way around. And uh, there's a lot of boys like that running about. But uh, it is a joy to be with you. I play golf with a few bandits, and they come from this church. <laughs> Uh, I was down in uh, Slave Russell. I couldn't stay the whole time, but we were down, and they said to me, you're coming to our church shortly. I says, that's right. And they says, don't be you but too long, you know. So you've spoiled them, John. Don't be too long. And I says, what's going to happen? He says, there'll be a set of keys on the pulpit you can lock up on the way out, because we'll be all away. They're up in the gallery there somewhere. I think I spotted them, just spotted them there now. So uh, they are here. I thought they wouldn't come, but they're here. But uh, it is a joy to be with you, and good to hear David again. I heard him yesterday afternoon, actually, and he was with us in the tent mission in uh, Cumber. We had perhaps one of the best tent missions that we've ever done in our entire life in Cumber, and there was a, quite a number of souls converted, and there was hundreds, and I mean that, there was hundreds through the door, and uh, the Lord has blessed. Those who were converted during the mission, uh, they're attending their churches, they're out at all the services. Those that were saved are coming to our own church, and they're out at every meeting, and they're in their prayer meeting. And that's a sure sign that the Lord has worked. And our brother David was singing at that mission as well. Everywhere I go, <laughs> you and I appear. He does the singing, I do the preaching. And I was with him yesterday. That CD, by the way, I've listened to every track on it already. And uh, I've also burned it on to a USB. Now, it's not illegal because I paid £15 for the CD. <laughs> And if it is illegal, so what? <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. I'm going back to my old days there. But it is a joy to be with you. I really do mean that. And uh, the Lord has been gracious and merciful. And the Lord has been so good to us all. So I just want to read a few verses from Psalm 34. Uh, words of the psalmist David whenever he said, Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. 
They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord, that's Christ, the messenger of Jehovah. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed, O the happiness of the man that trusteth in him. Amen. The Lord will bless his word to all of our hearts. We're standing in need of the Lord tonight. I just want to bow briefly in prayer. I know our brother has prayed and you have prayed in your prayer meeting, uh, but I just want to commit this testimony to the Lord. For me, it is an emotional roller coaster. That's all I can say. And in the gospel missions that I conduct, I always like to share a personal word of testimony. God willing, we'll be conducting a mission in Lurgan very soon and also in Balamagurney. And uh, I will be sharing my testimony. And I want to tell you, it is an emotional roller coaster. I said to Reverend Gray in the minister's room, the older you get, not that we're old, like really, but you get very sensitive to things and you do mellow. And upon reflection, there's a lot of things that I have reflected upon in my life and some of the horrendous things as a child have all come vividly back to me. And I want to tell you something, it destroys me. It really does. And it's hard for me to share my testimony and touch upon some things that are so personal to me. There's things I can't tell you. It's not crimes that I have done. It's things that has been done on me. Things in my home. Things that have happened to me. And I have been reflecting on some of those things and it has really hurt me. And I battle I do battle with anger at what happened to me in my home and what happened to me through drunken men and other things. And I just have to say to you, it's an emotional roller coaster for me to reflect upon my past. But I thank the Lord for his grace. I praise him for ever setting his love upon me. What he saw in the Martin family, I do not know. But he saw something in grace, something he loved, something he sent his son to die for, something that he knew that he could use at a certain point in time. He saw something not of worth or value, humanly speaking, but what grace can do that would, I trust, bring always glory to his precious name. Let's just bow briefly in prayer. Loving Father, it is with joy that we're found in the house of the Lord. We thank thee for those who have gathered friends and family we thank thee, Lord, for a real sense of thy presence. Thank thee for the special singing. Um, we thank thee, Lord, for thy servants who have faithfully ministered in the word. And we pray, Lord, as they have sung the gospel and they have touched our hearts again, that you'll bless and encourage them in their future ministry. As this CD has been launched, we pray that it will be used of God in a very special way. And we pray that many will come to know Christ as their Savior. Now as we uh, shut ourselves in with thee to hear uh, what the Lord hath done for a sinner, grant, O God, I pray, the solemnity of heaven. Lift this meeting out of the natural. Bring it into the supernatural realm. Lift it out of an ordinary meeting. Bring it into the extraordinary by the power of thy Holy Spirit. Lift it out of the usual into the unusual because Jehovah Shema, the Lord, is there. To this end, Almighty God, I stand before thee by blood alone. I ask, Lord, now as a candidate for the infilling of the Spirit, that thou wouldst anoint me, bring all things readily to my remembrance, and God grant that thou will give me the opening of the mouth in the midst of the people. We pray, Lord, for the unconverted, for those who are out of Christ without a Savior. We ask, Lord, you will work in their hearts repentance and faith. We pray, Lord, you'll turn them this night from their sin to the Lord Jesus Christ, for he shall save his people from their sins. And we pray, Lord, you'll bless thine own blood-bought people. Maybe there's some here tonight who have loved ones and family members and children or grandchildren that have gone astray. 
And it seems, oh God, there's little hope. But we pray, Lord, that even something said tonight would spark within them, Lord, that fire of faith again, that they will trust the Lord. They will see God work in their family and among their friends. So to this end, almighty God, give unto me now the infilling of thy spirit with wisdom and with power. And Father, we will give all the praise, the honor, and the glory to thy Son and to thee thyself. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. You know, I never was brought up in a Christian home, and I know that many perhaps have heard my testimony. They perhaps have even read the life story in those two books that were published, but I just want to tell you I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. I didn't have a mother who loved me, not even as a Christian. I didn't have a father who cared much for me. My mum and dad, sadly, were never married. My father ran away with uh, my mother, who was actually married to another man, and she had already three children to uh, another man called Calvin. My father ran away as a young person with Maureen, my mother. They headed over to England, and it was there that three children were born into that home. We've only discovered recently something of the horror of all that happened, and it doesn't make for good reading or conversation. However, I say this to you, I never knew the love of a mother. I can never remember a single moment that my mom ever hugged me. I can never a moment that she ever told me she loved me. I can never remember a single time that she ever gave me a kiss. I can't remember a single time that a happy moment with my mom. And my father was an alcoholic, and so was my mother. And sad to say, my father, when I was born in England, by the way, you wouldn't know that by the accent I have now, uh, but born in England, uh, I remember the first time I was introduced to alcohol. It was when I was about four years of age. I find it hard to understand. That really hurts me, that I would ever introduce my children to alcohol. It's my pet hate, and I'm not going there tonight. But I'll tell you this, my father, when I was four years of age, he had men round drinking. And they did that all the time. They just had drinking parties continually, right up until I ended up in in prison or my father got saved. Our house was a continuum, halfway house for every alcoholic and every drunkard and every person who gambled. And it was just a a horrible place. And I grew up in that that environment. My father used to fill a little cap filled with beer. And he used to press it to my lips and then give me another little drink and another little drink until I remember at four years of age staggering around a little living room in England. I heard one of the men say, Tommy, you need to stop that. He was embarrassed and my father had to stop giving me alcohol. I can't believe that he pressed alcohol to my lips. My brother Colin was introduced to alcohol the same time as I was. Uh, And up until he passed away, my brother Colin thankfully got saved, but he was an alcoholic and he loved to drink. He drank beer that was just sitting around the house, the same as a child would drink water or orange juice. He just got a taste for it. Thankfully, I didn't. My uncle Alec was an alcoholic. My father, my mother. I can think of all my school friends, and between drugs and alcohol, it destroyed many of their lives. If I was to place a school photograph of the year that I was in, or even the entire school year, or years, the three or four years I spent in Lurgan Boys Junior High School, I could show you a picture tonight of all those young people that are dead and are in eternity, and it's all alcohol-related. And alcohol destroyed our home. And my father lived. He was what we would call a functioning alcoholic, is that he could hold a full-time job down, and yet at the same time he would go on drinking binges. I remember whenever we were in England, there was nothing but fights and arguments, and for one reason or another, I don't know, My father took custody of his three children. Generally, the mother takes the children, but uh, my father took them. Sorry, I just spilled all the water over everything there, so hopefully it'll be okay. I'll just get that CD out of the road. Save the CD and nothing else. All right. But my father took custody of his three children. He brought us back to Northern Ireland to my grandparents' house, and we were brought to a place called Ardmore. It was there that I was first introduced to school. I don't know if I had gone to school in England. I can't remember. But all I know is this, that I was put in a year behind everyone else because I wasn't educated to the level of some of the ones in the primary school. And I don't know, but I'm nearly sure, unless there's a teacher, but I hardly think it because they were brave age here tonight that taught in Carrick School in Lurgan. Uh, I was put in, and I don't think I ever did P7. 
I moved from P6 straight into the junior high. Now you say that's an impossibility, but I can never remember going into P7. They put me in a class behind, and I was a class behind. They meant to move me on, but I think somewhere down the road I just got lost in transit and in all the administration, and they just kept me where I was. And it didn't matter to me if I was at school. I didn't like school. The teacher said to me, well, Thomas, how do you like school? I said, I like it closed. Or if you want to be politically correct in my day, I like it semtext. <laughs> now, you young people wouldn't know what that is, but I'll tell you what it means. It means to blow your school up. Well, my school was blown up. That's the truth. But I didn't do it. I did a lot of things. I did a lot of things, but I did not blow our school up. The Republican IRA, uh, Republicans blew up our school, and it wasn't me. That's one thing you can't blame me on in Lurgan. Uh, definitely didn't blow my own school up, although it was in my mind a few times. Well, I did like school three times. I was home time, dinner time, and break time. It's the only time I ever liked school. <laughs> There's times I couldn't find a way to the classroom, if you understand what I mean. My father sent me out to school. He went off to work, and I took refuge in a derelict house. I used to say I failed my geography exam that day because I couldn't find the classroom, and I just had to take refuge. But it's an awful day when you're mitching off school. Young people, do not follow me in that example, okay? Uh, schools, in fact, the state of school now to their 22 years of age, maybe even longer. There's people in their 40s and they're back to uh, night classes and furthering their education. I left school in my heart when I was four, but I wasn't allowed to leave till I was 15. It was one of those days when you didn't have to do the, in fact, you have to do GCSEs now. I think it's the law. Even if you don't want to do it, young person, it's law. You have to. But in my day, it wasn't, and you didn't have to. It was called the old O level. I left when I was 15. The teachers refused to teach me in the school. I just sat there. And I remember one metalwork teacher, and he says, you know, young Martin, I know you don't want to do these exams, but I need to submit something for you. He says, me, you do? He says, yeah, I need to put something in. You've got to have to do something. And I says, well, I, I'm not doing anything. He, and he says, he showed me this gallery, and he says, see up there, is there anything you like up there? And I'll submit that for the exam. And I says, there is. You see that gate? I've never seen a gate like it in my life. Beautiful. He says, I couldn't submit that. You get top marks, he says. He gave me an old poker. And then with a, with a ceramic pieces around the top of it. Do you remember making them at school? If anybody says yes, then you're giving away your age. And that's what I fired in, this old copper or brass poker with all this glass on the top of it. And I don't know what I got for it, but I was just sitting there. In fact, there was one day the, I was in technical drawing, TD as they call it, and I was sitting there. I, I never had a pencil. In fact, when I went home, I searched for pencils, and the only thing I could find was a builder's pencil. You ever seen them thick builder's pencil? Well, you try to do fine lines with a thick builder's pencil. I had no rubber, but I made a mistake. You know what I used? Now listen, the Lord is my witness. The Lord is my witness. Do you know what I used? The end of the heel of the loaf. I ripped it off and I rubbed out. Now it smudged the page a bit, but it did remove the pencil. Try it when you go home, by the way, just to say, your mother will kill you. <laughs> Just take the, the, the blue mold off the bread <laughs> and fire it in. But uh, I remember doing all that, and the teacher, the tech drawn teacher, said to me, Young Martin, you might as well be sitting at that school gate or standing at that school gate than sitting in this classroom. I was nearly up like a bullet and out to the school gate, because that's what he said. You might as well be there. I, I never had any formal education whatsoever. Uh, but during those times, whenever I was sent out to school, I got into a lot of trouble. My names were called. We weren't as well dressed as others. I'm not against charity shops, by the way, uh, but there was a, a charity shop down the road and they supplied us with all the children's clothes. Uh, they came with a black bin liner bag. There's a spina bifida shop in, in Hill Street in Lurgan. And they came with a black bin liner bag. And I, I want to tell you this, friends, in our house in 34 James Street, there was a room and it had no floorboards in it. All you had was the brick joists. The floorboards were rotten. And drunks used to come, used to come to our house. Now, I, I was mischievous, but I wasn't that bad. I remember one time there was a settee, and it was made out of leather straps. It was an old settee, just the cushions made out of leather straps, and there's one of the straps broken. And if you sat on that seat, you went right through, and your knees hit your face. There was many a night a drunk came in, and I said, take a seat. <laughs> You'd have seen a cut of them, boys. <laughs> First time you moved those legs like that in years. But I could have sent them into that room. Where's the toilet, son? Just see that door there, through there. And he just couped straight in, straight down, but I, I didn't. But there was another room, and half the floor wasn't rotten. And the floorboards were sound. And in that room, all those black bin liner bags were just emptied. And I mean emptied. I remember one time sitting in the middle of all of those uh, bags, 
never uh, those clothes, and I dressed myself. I had no colour scheme. Even to this day, my wife says, that doesn't go. I mean, what's wrong with it? She says, it doesn't go, Tom, it doesn't go. And I says, it looks all right to me, Tom. I'm telling you, it doesn't go. I dressed myself tonight, but this definitely goes. <laughs> but I remember sitting and I found these pair of shorts. Could have been winter time. And they had grey, purple, red, yellow, every colour under the sun. And they're all done in, in squares. And I put them on and they fitted. That's, all, that's how I judge my clothes, if they fit, wear them. And I found this brown T-shirt. And this bright yellow tank top. You know what a tank top young person is? A, it's really a jumper with any sleeves. And I put it on and I went into primary school. I got what is known that day as the wow factor. I walked in and they went, wow. Looked like a canary just out of the cage. I was that gullible. I thought, wow, it's not lovely. It was, wow, what on earth is that? But I was oblivious. And then my father's drinking got worse and worse and worse. He never paid a bill. He owed the housing executive uh, maybe it's two or three years' rent. He owed the electricity board so much money. I remember one time our electric was cut off. Father was in the Windsor Bar giving off about no electric in the house, and a man came down from the electricity board, and uh, he said, I remember letting him in, and he said, son, the electric's cut off. I says, that's right. And he came and he put it back on again. And the electricity board didn't know that 10 James Street, for we'd moved up the street, by the way, from 34 up to 10, and uh, the electricity was on again. The electricity board took my father to court, and because of the three children and the situation in the home, uh, they agreed, agreed to reduce the arrears, and he would pay so much a week out of his wage in order to pay off the electricity bill. I remember one time, uh, because I came home from school and that man knocked the door, and this man said to me, is your dad in, son? I says, no. He says, you know, he hasn't paid his electricity bill. And I, could have, I says, yes, not only that, I could tell you much he owes. And the man says, well, I'm here to cut it off. But that other man, he worked for the electricity board, and he came down two days later after it was cut off at the wire, at the meter, and he actually wired it up again, and we had free electric for a long time until the electricity board realized. I was in a meeting, and I shared that in my testimony, and this man met me at the door. You know what he said to me? He says, do you know who I am, son? I says, I do. I says, you're the man that put our electric on. And he says, I am. It's a good job it wasn't the boy that cut it off. <laughs> Hold my Bible to hit him. No, no violence. But that man said to me, son, I want to tell you something. I listened to your testimony tonight, and I want to tell you, I was in your house. I was at all those card schools. I was there when all those things were going on. You three boys were put up to bed. We used to go up and use the bathroom, and there you were, and we said hello to you in the bed, and the three boys were just huddled. There were no bed clothes, by the way. We didn't have a duvet. We didn't have a blanket. We used to joke, Dad, I've just pulled the sleeve out of the good duvet. It was an overcoat just thrown over us. There was one of our windows in my bedroom, and it had no glass in it. That's a fact, no glass. And I used to lie at night, doesn't matter whether it was winter or anything, lie at night with my head leaning out the window. And that's why I have no hair. It's all disappeared with the wind. <laughs> But I remember in the mornings during the summertime, I was lying in bed and my mates would have just come. They'd have climbed onto the coal shed, jumped across onto the kitchen, and they put their hand in and tapped me on the head and said to me, you coming out? And I just lay in my clothes anyway. So I just threw the, the overcoat to the side, straight onto the kitchen roof and out the whole day. And there was no food, absolutely no food. I was brought up by my neighbours. I was a street child along with my two brothers. We run the streets, my father worked, and then he came home, and we wouldn't go into the house. He was so angry. He was a drunken, violent man. And my family said to me, you shouldn't put your father down like that. But I say this to my entire family. You never lived with my father. And your body didn't bear the marks of his cruelty. But my body did. And I suffered at the hands of my father. And he also suffered at the hands of every drunken man that came into my house, and I just leave it there. It was horrendous, horrendous what happened to us as children. And in many ways, the neighbors were good to us, very kind, and very, very considerate. And they would have called me over and they said, have you had anything to eat? And I says, no. And they would have made Vita and cheese. It was, the, it was, the, it was the, the, the main stable diet in those days. And I tell you, I detest it now. No doubt there'd be a plate full of it in the supper the night. Vita and cheese, and there it is. Uh, but I was brought up on it. Vita and cheese. Now, uh, we had to, I, I, don't, I don't glory in this, but uh, we, we did steal. And we genuinely stole to eat. And uh, there was different scams that I was on. I was on a scam for the gas meter. 
It was the old shilling. And I found these washers, and they were the same size as the old shilling. And my father used to give me the money. He says, I'll put it in, Dad. And I put in the old washer, kept the shilling in my pocket. Then there was the old coins that we got, and my dad used to say to me, go across the next door and ask them, could you give a shilling for those coppers? So I went across, and the wee woman says to me, here, son, you keep that, and there's the shilling. So I put that in my pocket. I was on a great scam. I was making a few pounds. And then the gas man arrived one day, and me and the two brothers bolted out of the house. My dad says, what are they running for? And when the boy opened the little drawer, he pulled out the grey meter, and he opened the drawer and pulled the money out. And he says, Tommy, there's why they're running. It was my uncle, actually, who was the gas man. And he says, there's why they're running. Tommy, there's nothing in that. But look, there, there's foreign coins and washers. There's nothing. And my father had to put it in his pocket. He had to pay whatever the gas man needed. And then when I come in, my father used to beat me. Well, at least I was getting paid for that. He used to beat me for nothing, but I got paid for that one. He was on a scam with a TV meter. We moved into decimal currency in 1971, and my father hired a television from Radio Rentals up in Lurgan Town Centre. And I knew, he used me, he'll hire, he'll hire this, he'll pay one month's uh, 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 rent for it, because we rented the TV. We had the first 50-inch TV in Northern Ireland, did you know that? 50 inches from the front to the back. It was a massive brute of a thing. It sat in a corner. And my father said to me, son, when you get home from school, you're, you're going to get a colour TV. And I was so excited. And my hopes were built up. And he'd be a colour TV. I couldn't wait. Couldn't wait to get out of school. You know, my father did. Do you remember the old Lucasade bottles? And they were covered with orange film. He ripped them all off and he stuck it over the TV with sellotape. It was a black and white one, but he says, there's your colour TV. I was raging. But he got a, a colour TV. But I knew he'll never pay the rent for this. He pays for nothing. Drink's more important to him than paying his bills. And I remember coming home, my dad says to me, you're taking the TV off us, son. I haven't paid the bill. And I knew. So you, the man agreed to put in a metre. It was 10p. And my father had found a set of keys that actually fixed the, uh, suited the metre. And he could open the wee drawer. And he regurgitated this one 10 pence piece. And it kept going through, and you got 10p for one hour's viewing. And whenever the man came to empty the meter, I didn't bolt this time. I was in a scam with a gas meter, but not the TV. So I waited to see what the dad would say to the man. And when he opened the drawer, here's what the man said. Tell me, there's not much in there. And here's what my dad said. He says, I know, he says, but the boys don't watch much TV. Now, I watched TV until a little dot appeared. Do you remember that? You young people wouldn't. It's 24-hour viewing now. But the television actually went off. Did you know that? It actually stopped. And you couldn't watch it anymore. What a world did we live in. <laughs> and on BBC One, the national anthem was played every single night of the week. And for seven days in the week, and right through 365 as it, days in the year, we stood in 10 and 34 James's Street for the national anthem at 12 midnight. And there wasn't a single night. My father was drunk, and he used to say, right boys up, and we stood like Egypts in our living room. God save our... Knew it inside out from us young. And then off to bed. And the man says, and my dad says, Tommy, they don't watch too much TV. And again, my father had to give it a few more 10 peas. But you know, life for us centered around my dad's alcohol. When he came home from work, he was sober. And he was a kind, and he was a very loving father. But then he went out to drink. I remember him going out on a Thursday night. I was not even a teenager. He went out on a Thursday night, and he never returned home again until the early hours of Monday morning. I used to be going round the pubs in Lurgan looking for my dad. I found him in the Windsor Bar one night. Frosted glass, you couldn't see through the windows. Pubs are different. But the law of the land then was that all public houses must have frosted glass, no clear glass. And even on the brightest day of the year, the light was on in a public house. How dark is a public house? And the stench of the beer and the mats. I could smell it walking past public houses today. I remember standing for hours just looking some money off my dad for food. I remember men telling me, what are you doing here, son? Away on home. I says, I want to see my dad. He's not here. I says, he is. He's over there. And through the haze of smoke, I could see my father. And he had asthma. I heard him coughing. And even though there could have been a hundred men in that bar, I says, that's him there over there. Get you away on home, son. And then eventually, after a few hours, my father came out and he just verbally abused me. 
And he says, what do you want? He says, well, Dad, they've sent me up. We need something to eat. And my father cursed me up and down and then just threw some coins to me and I gathered it up and run on home. And we got ourselves crisps and bananas and stuff out of the local shop. And that's how he treated us. And then he came home in violent tempers. My father and I had no real relationship. There's a lady called Elsie came round to our house. She was a born-again Christian. She knew and loved the Lord. And she believed in her heart, I, I know that, that Christ was the answer to our home. Now, I know the neighbours didn't bother much with us and other people called us names. And I understand that. And society rejected us. I, I fully appreciate and understand that. But I remember Elsie coming round and she showed us Christian love. Really, Christ came into our home. And Elsie was a lovely lady. She's still alive today. She came into our home and she could control my dad and she'd make sure that we were fed and that we were looked after when she was a great lady. And her desire was to get my father out to church and to get these children to Sunday school. And Elsie persevered. I remember her saying to my dad, Tommy, would you not come out to church? And my dad said, no, Elsie, you know, I wouldn't be able to make it, but I know the boys would love to go to church and I didn't want to go to church. As much as the Pope wants to be the moderator of the Free Presbyterian Church, that I want to go to church. And, uh, but my father made me, and he says, Elsie, the boys will be ready. Into the room where all the clothes were, suited and booted, and out to church. As times I was dragged out to church by this year, it's a wonder it's this size. And then Elsie said, Tommy, would you not come? No, Elsie, but I know the boys love church. And she said, well, will they come to the youth club? So we went on a Friday night to the youth club. She says, Tommy, on Monday night, we're having confirmation classes in the church. And I thought, please, Dad, not confirmation. And my dad said, Elsie, they would love to be confirmed. She came back again. She says, Thursday night, Tommy, there's the boys' brigade. So there's Friday night youth club, the Sunday morning Sunday school, Sunday morning church, Sunday evening church. And we went along to the Free P Church in Georgia Street as well on the Sunday afternoon. And then Monday night was confirmation classes. Thursday night was, was the boys' brigade. There wasn't too many nights left in the week, but there was one night I loved. It was Mournview Disco. A young person's disco was on a Tuesday night in Mournview. And I was first in last night. I was religious. <laughs> Never missed it. Loved it. Couldn't dance, but I went in anyway. But I want to tell you something. Elsie came round with a tape recorder. It's not the new gadget you get today. Technology's moved on. It was a massive tape recorder the size of a breeze block. And Elsie, and that's the time we did have electric, she said, would the boys like to sing into that? And we did. We sung one by, I think it was Marie Osmond called Paper Roses. You'll not find it in your course book. If you do, fart in the bin on the way out. We sung into this tape recorder. And your David Warwick and his wife here and others who are on that CD. You ever heard yourself sing? Oh, it's bad. And I remember the three of us singing Paper Roses. And then Elsie played it back to my dad and said, Tommy, what do you think of that? My dad must have been full drunk. He says, Elsie, that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> it was like fallen angels. And Elsie hit my dad with this one. Tommy, would the boys like to join the choir? And I thought, no, please, please. I beg you, Dad, not the choir. Yes, Elsie would love to join the choir. When was choir practice? Tuesday night. Tuesday night. First time I met the choir master. I'll tell you this. I don't think he ever smiled in his life. I went into the choir room with my two brothers. I remember him saying, here, over here. I come over and he gave me a frilly collar. He says, put that on. I had this long hair, strawberry blonde. I've got a short back and shine now, but it's strawberry blonde hair. And he says, put that on, and I did, and I thought, there's no way I'm wearing this. And he wasn't finished. He, my two brothers decked out with a frilly collar as well. He says, over here, son. And he gave me a black frock. And he says, black frock and a frilly collar? Look at me. I'm like a girl. Sorry, girls. <laughs> he wasn't finished. He says, over here. And he gave me a white smock. Went out to about there. Frilly collar, black frock and a white smock. And I thought, there's no way am I wearing this. I had to walk up and down the aisle of a church, twice on a Sunday and twice on a Sunday evening. And he gave me a music book, friends. Let me tell you about that music book. It had the Nook de Menace in it. It had all these different things. I, didn't, I couldn't read music. I couldn't tell you. Which way do you hold this? Upside or down. The only thing I knew that the writing, which it said... St. John's Church of Ireland. The writing had to be there, so I knew if I kept it there and opened it like that, I've got the right thing. And I walked up and down the aisle. He says, because you're the smallest, you lead the junior and the senior choir every Sunday. And I walked up and down that aisle, and I could see all my mates, and they were laughing their heads off. My face was beetroot. 
But it wasn't too long before their parents put them into the junior choir, and that took the smile off their faces. There's no joy in being a choir when you're not saved. <laughs> That's all I can say. But you know what else? He was good. She got my dad out to church. Fast forward, and I have to. Fast forward. She got my father out to church. It was 1976. I'll never forget it. David said to my dad, where are you going? And he said, son, I'm going to a gospel tent mission with Elsie. It was in Lurgan Boys Junior High School. The evangelist was Dick Saunders. It's called the Way to Life Crusade. The Reverend Timothy Nelson, by the way, got saved at that same mission. And I remember my father going. We couldn't believe it. But David said, Dad, are you going to a darts match? You're not going to the Windsor. You're, not going, to, you're going to Glenavon. He says, son, I'm going with Elsie. Elsie persevered, wouldn't give up. She got him out. I'll never forget the night he came home. He didn't barge, he didn't shout. He went straight to bed, which was very unusual. I heard his voice upstairs, lads, come up here, I want you. And the three of us, Colin, David, and myself, we raced up, jumped on his bed, and as best as my dad knew how, he said these words to us. He said, lads, your old man's got saved. We didn't even know what that word meant. And David said, you mean there's no more drink, Dad? He says, son, that's right, no more drink. Friends, can I tell you from 1976 up until February 25th, 1990, my father was called home to glory. Not one drop of drink crossed his lips. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them and delivereth them. He delivers them, he keeps them. Maybe that's why you're not saved tonight. Maybe you haven't repented and believed. Maybe why you haven't trusted in Christ and looked to his finished work and shed blood because you feel you couldn't keep it. But you're right, you couldn't. But the Lord will do the keeping. The Lord will save you and he'll keep you. And he did that for my daddy. And my father took an industrial claim against a factory where he had injuries. And in 1976, friends, he was awarded £5,000. That's a massive amount of money then. People in the Windsor Bar says, Tommy will only be back at the Windsor Bar. They actually says he'll buy it. And what a day that'll be when Tommy Martin owns the Windsor Bar in Lurgan. I want to tell you, friends, my father used the money for the Lord. And he bought us things he never bought us in his life. But sadly, unless we're converted ourselves, we just went our own way. Fast forward 1981, the height of the hunger strikes in this province. Many of you know them well. Some of young people have seen the documentaries. Uh, but 10 men had starved themselves to death in the infamous Mays Prison. Loyalist prisoners in around the Mid Ulster area, especially Lurgan and Portadown, were recruiting a lot of young men, to swell out, young men to swell out their ranks for what they had termed was a doomsday battle. And I remember David and myself being introduced to the secrecy of the paramilitaries and the thrill of that life. I remember being introduced to drug and drink parties. I could take you to the very place to this very moment. It's still there that flat in Portadown. I can take you right now. I can take you to it. Where David and I went to those parties. I remember being sworn in to the Ulster Volunteer Force. I remember giving our first assignment. I remember different other things happening, which I don't want to go into. I remember the RUC coming at our house six o'clock in the morning, a massive thump at the door. I knew full well what was happening. And I remember my name and David's name being mentioned at the door. My father reminiscing with them now, screaming, crying. All the neighbors in the Mournview estate were out. I remember being handcuffed. David was 18, I was 19 years of age. I remember being hauled off to Armagh, to Gough Barracks, questioned, demanded in custody. And then our case took a turn for the worse. The first loyalist supergrass turned Queen's evidence, visited him not so long ago in McGilligan Prison. He has spent some 29 years incarcerated in prison. And an infamous name. I visited with him recently. First time in his life he said to me, I'm sorry. And I says, no, you didn't do it. I bore my own sins punishment. The consequences were my own. I told him he needed to be saved. And he needed to come to Christ, repent and believe. Be able to share the gospel. But you know, Sadly, our case took a turn for the worse. 27 men from this area were implicated in terrorist activities. Our entire case was called William Stephen Wright versus the Crown, the late Billy Wright. I remember standing in the, the court as a young person. I remember hearing the judge starting to sentence me, and he sentenced me to some 27 years in prison. My brother David was sentenced to some 39 years in jail. I was able to process in my mind that he said the word concurrently, not consecutive. 
So I was able to process in my mind that I would serve the stiffest sentence. I was able to work it out there and then that I had six years at least to serve in prison. I was dragged down with another young fellow from County Armagh, Armagh City there. We were dragged down to uh, the Crumlin Road. We were kept there. We were meant to go down to the H blocks, but the Loyalists had begun their protest after the uh, Republicans had finished their hunger strike. And this young fella, and thank the Lord, I don't want to mention his name, he's dead now. We had the joy of going down to his house. And a week later, that young man came to Christ. But I will tell you this, we were the youngest prisoners in Northern Ireland at that time. They couldn't put us into Hyde Bank, our sentence was too stiff. They couldn't place us down in the infamous Mays prison because we were under 21 years of age and it was a maximum security prison. And they didn't know what to do with us. And they put us behind the wire, places in D-Wing. They kept in solitary confinement. And it was there for two weeks we were kept and then someone uh, basically reclassified us as long-term prisoners and sent us down to the Mays prison. And what a baptism into prison that was. And I want to tell you, I was on protest, sadly, for some 14 months. And during that time, it was the worst time I spent on earth. I ended up doing an extra six months and a week in prison because of bad behavior on top of the six years I'd already sentenced to. So people tell you that prison would change me. And if I was in jail, I would become a Christian too. That is nonsense. Many young men and young women have passed through Ulster's prisons and they've come out seven times the child of the devil when they went in. It's the grace of God. You know, as times when they made bad behavior, the Lord began to work. You'd hardly believe it that through bad behavior. I was isolated from the prison population because of bad behavior and there are psychopaths in there. I was placed in solitary confinement for days on end. It's called the boards. And nothing else to do but read a Bible that was sitting in my cell. I reckon it was a Gideon's Bible. I've already shared my testimony on their website. I've been interviewed concerning that just this year. I remember sitting reading that Bible. I didn't know where to start. I just started to read. And there's no doubt the Lord began to speak. The Father, the prayers of many Christians outside for the two Martin boys. The 13th of June, 1983. I'd received a little booklet that was on protest. I received a little booklet by the late Noel Grant called Let Him In. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. And he basically explained that repentance was the opening of the door. And then receiving was believing. Believing that Christ was God who came into the world, lived a sinlessly perfect life and then died on the cross as my substitute. You know, it wasn't a stiff prison sentence and it was hard enough that broke me. It wasn't the fact that I was in protest. And by the way, I visited a young man recently in McGabry. He's being extradited to the USA uh, for murder. And I want to tell you uh, where he's going to in Florida, they have the death penalty. And most likely he will be put to death. I was down with him and he complained to me bitterly. He says, you know, I've been locked up for 23 hours a day for three weeks. I says, three weeks? He says, yes. And I says to him, listen to me. I don't want to give his name. I says, whenever you have been locked up for 23 hours a day, for two and a half years, and one day, I'll not understand what you're going through. So don't give me three weeks. I was locked up for two and a half years. That's right. It's inhumane. I was locked up for two and a half years for 23 hours a day. I was allowed one hour's exercise and I can tell you, friends, I can't really remember when I got it. I can't remember really when I got my exercise. And so don't tell me that if you were in prison, you'd become a Christian too. You wouldn't. It'd harden your heart. It's the grace of God. And when I read that Bible... And I read that little booklet. I realized the love that the Lord has for me. For me. That's what broke me. I realized that Christ died for me. Why me, Lord? Why? Useless. Worthless. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. And I should be in hell. That's where I should be. And that's where I ought to be. And I know that. I really know that. I ought to be in hell. But the Lord set his love upon me. Sent his son to die for me. 
and he saved me on the 13th of June, 1983. I told the entire protest wing that I'd got saved. Seven weeks later, the 31st of July, 1983, my brother David got saved. I remember the letters we wrote out to my dad to tell him that we had come to know Christ as our Savior. And then from that moment, we began to study the life of Christ in the Bible, followed his footsteps to Calvary, uh, generally walking from the upper room there and the singing of the Paschal Halal, Psalms 113 through to 118. And as the Lord made his way down into the Kidron Valley, to the Garden of Gethsemane, to be betrayed, then taken to the house of Caiaphas, falsely accused, the greatest travesty of justice the world has ever known. His mouth busted open, contrary to the law, falsely accused, no evidence, then handed over to Pilate, then to Herod and back to Pilate, and then scourged by the Roman soldiers and laid up Golgotha's hill. These things broke my heart. And then spiked to an old Roman gibbet, lifted up for Thomas Martin. We took communion this morning. I thought poignantly about it. It was my sins when I put the bread in my mouth, crushed the bread. It was my sins that crushed his body on the tree. It was my sins that caused him deep agony and pain when he took my place, when he died for me, when he suffered and paid the price and rose from the dead and then set his love upon me as a vile, wretched child of the devil, a child of wrath, a sinner, ill-deserving, undeserving, and I'll add another, hell-deserving. And yet he saved me, and he saved my brother, and he saved my father. And I want to tell you, friends, he saved my brother Colin a year and a half before he passed. The Lord has been good. Why did he save the Martin family? He could have left us. And if we were in hell tonight, we would have to bow our hearts and say, the Lord is just. And this is a place we ought to be. Just as I deserve the maze prison, so I deserve God's penitentiary hell. But he saved me from it. And friends, I'll never be there. And many people in this world haven't forgiven me, and I understand that, I accept that. And I'm barred, by the way, from many countries, can't travel. I'm on the mission board and had to put me on the home missions, <laughs> can't put me on the foreign field. I can't travel because of my sin. It's a consequence as young people of living for the world and the devil and the flesh and not having Christ as your Savior and Lord. I met my wife when I was in prison. Be careful what I said, one, because she's not here tonight. And two, it's taped. I should have said three. She told me, don't you ever say that again. I met my wife when I was in prison. I said that in a meeting. I didn't mean anything bad. This dear old lady met my wife at the door and she said there, what are we in for, love? <laughs> my wife was horrified horrified. She says to me, don't you ever say you met me in prison? I mean, sure I did. No, but the way it comes across, you think I was in. I mean, what do you mean? She says, a wee woman at the door said to me, what were you in for, love? And I mean, what do you say to her? My wife says, I was in for triple murder. Why? <laughs> no, she didn't. No, she didn't. My wife was saved when she was eight years of age. Rededicated her life to Christ under a Sam Workman crusade. She didn't smoke, drink, curse, go to cinema or discos. Now listen to it. Yet she needed to be saved. Isn't that remarkable? Because you would say his brother David, expelled from school, thrown out of the UDR, in the paramilitaries, doing what he's doing, in incarcerated in the Mays prison, a bad article, and you're right. You're absolutely right. Those people need to be saved, and you're right. So they do. And so did I. But you do. You don't have to go to prison to be a sinner just born into this world. There's no difference. Puts a circle around us all. For all have sinned. All. Why does it not include you? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You've missed the mark. You're imperfect. You'll never be in heaven. One sin will keep you out of heaven. That's right. One sin. One sin will separate between you and God. One sin will damn your soul in hell. How many sins have you committed? Yet Christ died for sin on the cross. And if you come like we did, as guilty sinners to the Lord, tonight the Lord will save you. But I met my wife in prison. Whenever I came out of prison, we got married, and I told June that we're into a life sentence now. Uh, but uh, the Lord has been good to us. He's given us three children, three boys. They're as wild as March hares. They take after their mother's nature. I, I know they do. But you know something? I don't wish silver or gold for my children. They'll never be brain surgeons. They might try to make it, but they'll never be. I'm not putting them down, by the way. 
I love my boys more than anything in this world apart from the Lord and my wife. I don't desire silver or gold for my children. You know what I desire? That they might walk with the Lord. That's all I desire. That they might know Christ and walk with him and serve him. I got the call to Bible college when I came out of prison after I got married. Entered into the Whitfield College of the Bible. And uh, I was released from prison. Or sorry, released from the, am I joking? The Whitfield College of the Bible. And uh, did four years in study there. And I was then ordained in the ministry in 19... 98 in Lisburn. I was there for some 23, 24 years. He said, Lisburn folks in here tonight as well. And uh, then I got the call to Cumber, and the Lord has been so good to me. I met my mother about 15 years ago, and I spent two years with her. And she was a, a drunkard, cursed like a trooper, and smoked as well. And in the Dong Hospital, we were the last ones to speak to her about her soul. And we urged upon her the need to repent and believe. And maybe we'll see my mother Maureen in heaven. I don't know. But the Lord has been good to us. And I'm sorry for going on so long. The keys aren't here, boys, so I think I'm all right. I'll not get thrown out. There is supper, so I'll be all right for another half hour, I think. Now I'm going to finish here. The Lord has been so good to me, and I mean that. I really mean that. And there's no one more humble and gracious like our God that he would stoop to save a sinner like me. And he can do the same for you. It's not about me tonight. It's about him. And what he's done for me, he can do for you. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you can. And your sins, no matter what they are, no matter how bad you think you are, and who told you that you can't be saved? Who told you that? The devil. Or else you've convinced yourself on some pity party that you're going on. You can be saved, but you'll only be saved by repenting of your sin and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ who suffered, bled, and died on the cross. And if you come to him tonight, he'll save you. He will save you now. Let's bow briefly in prayer. Father, we thank thee for this evening for a sense of thy presence. We thank thee, Lord, for the special singing, the congregational singing, the reading of scripture. We thank thee for the offering of prayer. Thank thee, Lord, for the testimony. And that which is of man, it'll fall to the ground and die, rightly so. But that which is of thyself will live on. And we pray, Lord, you'll bless that which is of thyself. Back at home, burn it in. And bless it to every soul. Lord, we pray that you'll save tonight. Pray that you'll restore to first love tonight. Pray that you'll revive the church and bless this work here in Tandragee. These gospel missions coming up and those that have commenced, bless the preaching of the word. And save souls, we pray. Take of our thanks now for the good things that have been provided. And as many take their seat at the table and eat and drink, that we do so with a thankful heart and afterward part us in thy fear and favor. And bless the activities of this house, we pray, and all the faithful houses of God. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.